Well, uh, good. Uh, hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the latest in RUSI's adversarial studies seminar series, in which we seek to examine how uh, competitor approaches to strategy and uh, to strategy and warfighting will force Western and allied uh, uh, militaries to evolve as the 21st century progresses. I'm Siddharth Koshal. I'm a fellow here at the military sciences team at RUSI. And today it's my great pleasure to welcome Rear Admiral James Goldrick, who will be speaking to us about the rise of the People's Liberation Army Navy and its ramifications for actors both within the region and beyond. Uh, it wasn't long ago, the turn of the millennium, in fact, that one prominent academic used the analogy of the elephant and the whale to describe the US and China, a great land power and a great sea power, each of which would struggle to compete in the other's domain of strength. Well, what a difference 20 years can make. Last year, the PLA Navy became the world's largest Navy by the numbers, a number which probably undercounts its true strength as it excludes its paramilitary forces and the ground-based strategic rocket forces that support China's uh, military naval strategy. And yet for all our growing interest and knowledge of this dazzling array of technical capabilities, our knowledge in this area has perhaps outstripped our understanding of China's strategic intentions. What does China want from this maritime force? Does it want to be a globally postured force on the, on the uh, maritime commons, a more regionally preponderant force? Or are its intentions more defensive, driven perhaps by fear of what is still qualitatively a superior US-led maritime alliance? Uh, today, to help us shed light on some of these questions, we have a particularly illustrious speaker. Admiral Goldrick has had a long career in the Royal Australian Navy, in uh, uh, primarily as an ASW specialist, in which he has commanded the HMAS Sydney and Cessna. His command roles have included heading the Australian Navy's surface task group, the Gulf Maritime Interdiction Group, and the, uh, the Interagency uh, Australian Border Protection Force. Uh, following his naval career, uh, in his second career as an academic, uh, Admiral Goldrick has been uh, in, uh, has been affiliated with a number of institutions, including the University of New South Wales and ANU. He's a widely published author, having uh, written books on subjects ranging from the Battle of Jutland all the way through to the com contemporary maritime dynamics of South and Southeast Asia, uh, and someone who's uh, extraordinarily well positioned to uh, help us answer some of the, the pressing questions of the day. So Admiral, first of all, thank you very much for making the time to join us today. Uh, thank before you, thank I you, Siddharth. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, if you're happy for me to start, I'll switch to share screen. And uh, absolutely. Uh, just one thing before I, yep. I hand over to you, which is uh, on a uh, the question of attributability. Uh, the Admiral's speech will be on the record, but the Q&A is off the record. And I just direct your attention to the Q&A button, bottom right hand corner of your screens for that point of the discussion. And, and with that, uh, Admiral, over to you. Well, thank you, Siddharth. It's very kind of you, um, and I'm delighted to have been invited to speak today. Um, let me take up no a number of the points that Siddharth has touched on. Um, the first one I want to make is that I think Chinese naval strategy, and I'm going to speak very specifically, uh, very largely about navies, although I'm really talking about the maritime as a whole, um, but China's strategy for its navy and its uh, naval forces really has two key dimensions, which I think are very important. Um, the first off is to understand China's the ultimate continental power. The central kingdom um, has a continental outlook that's you know, housed in thousands of years of history. It shares um, its land borders with 14 other nations, many of whom it doesn't like. But as it looks out as a continental power, it is surrounded. Um, it has, as you can see, there's South Korea, there's Japan, there's Taiwan, Philippines, Malaysia, Maritime Southeast Asia. You know, there is the sense if you're looking out continentally, you are surrounded. China has no clear access to the Pacific. And of course, China's century of shame created this um, sense of vulnerability towards, um, towards being attacked uh, from the sea in a way that, um, you know, effectively un undermined Ch China's capacity and its sovereignty over many years. And indeed, if you look at some of the uh, current military basing um, of the Americans, um, you know, you can see again why China might have this attitude uh, that it is surrounded and that there are uh, potential adversaries um, very close to its continent. 
And this is a fundamental, I think, part of Chinese naval strategy, which I think is embedded in its wider national defense strategy, uh, which is the idea of protecting the central kingdom, uh, of protecting um, China from a, a repeat of any kind of the century of shame and the advent of naval forces. And this, I think, is a key force structure determinant. It's what they're doing so much of, although as Sid up touch on, touched on, it's, involved, it's also involving many other elements of the Chinese military and indeed Chinese capability generally. It's a cross-spectrum effort, which is, includes the maritime militia and the Coast Guard, but it also includes strategic rocket forces. And of course, it's employing a whole web of sensor and targeting te technology. So I see this idea of the sort of capabilities that are associated with being able to dominate out to what the Chinese have uh, defined as the first island chain run running south uh, through the home islands of Japan, through the Ryukus and Senkakus, down to Taiwan, through the Philippines and through um, Borneo, um, that they will be able to dominate in its entirety. But one point I'd like to make is I do think the Chinese have a territorial outlook and this is partly reflected in their behavior in the South China Sea which I'll touch on in a minute. They're not thinking completely in maritime or indeed naval terms, they're really applying very continentalist land strategy to this defensive idea um, and of course they want to be able to dominate completely inside the first island chain, be able to dominate to the second island chain and indeed out to the third island chain which includes Hawaii. Now, as I say, I think this is a fundamental of their force structure development, and I think this is the basis upon which, let's say, China had major economic problems if the PLAN uh, were to reduce its um, expansion, if it were to constrain certain force elements, it would retain its efforts to develop its submarine force, its missile forces, uh, both seaborne and uh, land-based. And of course, I think although the Taiwan issue has tremendous geopolitical dimensions and many other aspects, and I'm not saying that this adds a particular urgency to the Taiwan problem, but it does add an important context to Taiwan is that with if China had control of Taiwan, China would have unfettered access to the Pacific Ocean. And I think this is one of the developments of the last 20 years um, that has changed the way China looks at Taiwan and certainly it changes the way that the Chinese Navy uh, will look at Taiwan uh, because without Taiwan arguably the Chinese could could say that they they can be monitored as they're seeking to access the world's oceans and of course that brings us to the South China Sea now this territorial idea I think is very important I do think China looks at it as the same way as they do territory and indeed the Chinese talk about blue land in much of their oceans policy the South China Sea, I believe the Americans have used the term the Great Wall of Sand to talk about the um, uh, artificial islands which have been put in the Spratleys and of course the developments in the Paracels. And actually that term I think is, is a relevant term. I think it is accurate as a metaphor because it does indicate the way, the way the Chinese are looking at it. But also this has become part of China's nationalist narrative and there are other dimensions here, I think, to the South China Sea to Japan's efforts to dominate. Um, but I'd also like to point you to the, uh, the deep water areas here, uh, which arguably with the Chinese uh, nuclear submarine base and their ballistic missile submarine base up in Hainan, uh, could in fact be the core of a bastion strategy for China. Um, and indeed, if you look at this um, chart of the various claims, uh, you'll note that actually that deep water area, area I showed was in Vietnam. And what the Chinese, of course, have done is um, um, effectively put uh, the artificial islands down in the south, uh, really as forward bases for surveillance, for forward operating. Um, but I think that idea of a great wall of sand has a relevance in the way things are looked at. Now, what's interesting is that, in fact, the um, uh, although the Paracels are an important part of this dimension, uh, there's a gap which of course is Scarborough Shoal, and I'll touch on that in a minute. Because of course, what we see is this all arms effort uh, by China uh, to create the artificial islands, to use their maritime militia. And indeed in the last few days, around about Whitsun uh, Reef, which is round about here, uh, the Filipinos are making the point very truthfully 
and clearly that there are hundreds of Chinese fishing vessels, which look more, much more like maritime militia than fishing vessels, uh, congregating in that area. Um, and this effort to really um, dominate is cross-spectrum, is using all their uh, capabilities. But there's a missing element, and that's Scarborough Reef, because if you do have this Great Wall of Sand idea, and you've got the Paracels up there and the Spratleys there, then there's Scarborough down here, but that's not been fortified. Uh, the, Ch the Chinese have, have not yet, in the same artificial island terms, tried to do anything. My personal belief is that the reason they haven't is that the Americans have indicated that is something of a red, red line. Now, what I want to touch on is how are the Americans responding to this? Well, I think we are seeing to some extent with the Americans uh, in their response, um, an approach that is resonating, it rhymes with the maritime strategy of the 1980s, where the Americans proceeded to threaten a continental power, and I think were very effective in playing to Soviet fears by the idea that they could uh, move forward and attack um, Soviet bases, and indeed the Soviet bastion, bastions of their ballistic missile submarines. And I think what the Americans have talked about in their advantage at sea with, this, with their distributed lethality concept is this idea uh, that via a whole means, by many means, by many plat platforms and much innovative te technology, they can threaten the Chinese. And I think that this, the idea of this strategy is that in fact, if they can pose uh, a sufficient uh, credible threat uh, to play on the Chinese fears of attack of the Chinese attack on the Chinese mainland, or certainly domination of the waters proximate to the Chinese mainland, that that will have a key deterrent effect. And I do think that's the way the Americans are moving in the way they're thinking. Um, as we well know, there are many structural problems the Americans have, and this will be interesting to see how it plays. But I want to touch now on the. Um, Japanese as part of this. Uh, the Japanese have been doing a number of things which are quite important in response. They've been spending somewhat more on their defence force. They do have an emphasis on strengthening the Navy, the Maritime Self-Defence Force. They're putting F-35 to sea. More important, they're expanding their submarine force. And perhaps most important, because they fear what the Japanese actually have named the Falkland scenario, they fear preemptive Chinese occupation of uh, Senkaku or Raya or islands even in the Ryukus, um, that they are have developed with the Japanese ground self-defense force an amphibious capability and they're practicing that as much as they can in order to be able to deal with any kind of Chinese uh, preemptive intervention, particularly if it followed the model of the Falklands in the South Atlantic with the idea of having some paramilitary or indeed Chinese Sub civilian groups coming ashore. But the second strand of Chinese naval activity, its maritime activity, is really based upon China's expanding and largely legitimate interests in the global maritime system and, of course, Chinese distant economic interests. And the Belt and Road, uh, which of course extends into the Indian Ocean uh, and indeed into Europe, uh, is not simply a Chinese plan for. Um, economic development, it is also showing where Chinese have substantial activities uh, and not simply commitments of money, but of course, um, enormous numbers of people. And do not discount China's concern about its importance to protect its people. You have a one child policy, the one child becomes very important. And the Chinese, of course, done uh, services protected evacuation from a number of areas. But of course, the importance of this is that China has actually changed its policy and of course has now established a major base in Djibouti as a logistic base uh, to, to support it, it, its activities. Now, I do see that much of this is legitimate because China has interests, it has people, it does have vulnerabilities, and of course, it is vitally dependent upon the movement of um, energy of oil uh, from the Persian Gulf through the Strait of Hormuz and then around through maritime Southeast Asia. And it now has uh, dependencies and interests in the maritime sphere, which of course it never had before. And I see a lot of what it's doing with its force development, um, while many aspects are what you could call multi-skilled, and I particularly think their large service combatant force is multi-skilled in the sense that they form part of their defensive missile 
batteries um, around the Chinese continent, but also, as we know, with the extended Chinese deployments in the Indian Ocean, that they have a role in that. And what we're seeing is, I think, China is emulating the United States and indeed the United Kingdom's historic record because it's seen what you can do with naval forces. If you have aircraft carriers, you are somebody. People get out of the way when you walk down the road. Um, if you have amphibious groups, amphibious ready groups, you can intervene across a range of things. And what I would say is that while I think this is often about competition with the West, particularly the Americans, and it may be used in conflict, Things like aircraft carriers and so on, I think are for other purposes than a conflict with the United States. They're about competition, but they're also, I think legitimately about China's um, effort to um, really assert its and protect its maritime interests. Now, of course, there are tensions and there's a great game. And I think the term great game uh, for what's happening in the Indo-Pacific and the maritime domain is not a bad term, is particularly being played out with India. Uh, for influence in the region. And indeed, Australia is drawn into this somewhat in the Indian Ocean, but of course, sig significantly in the South Pacific. And of course, that great game has political and economic and financial and social aspects, as well as military ones. And in, indeed, in places like the Pacific, it's really not military, it's all those other things, um, the South Pacific rather. But of course, we're seeing this enormous Chinese development. This picture was taken at one of the major Chinese shipyards in Shanghai, uh, I think nearly two years ago. Uh, not all of these service combatants are under construction. Some are being refitted. But basically, you have nearly as many service combatants um, shown here as the Royal Navy has, and you have rather more than the Australian Navy has. And of course, as Siddharth has pointed out, China's numbers are increasing tremendously. You know, their building rate is extraordinary. I do have some concerns as to how they're managing about training um, and their capabilities for operations, uh, the speed with which they're expanding. So of course, they now have two aircraft carriers, one the uh, Liaoning, the renovated uh, former Soviet construction unit, and of course, the um, Shandong, the new, not cloned, but genetically modified Chinese built version. Um, and of course, uh, Liaoning has been at sea in the vicinity of Taiwan in the South China Sea in the last few weeks. I think they're being cautious about these. We haven't yet seen the aircraft carriers in the Indian Ocean. I think we will. And I think we'll see the car aircraft carriers go much further afield. Uh, the Chinese, I believe, within the next three to four years, will show particularly the United Kingdom that two can play at the carrier global de deployment game. Um, but. I do think they're fundamentally for the Indian Ocean. And I think that although it looks at this stage as though Chinese carrier program will probably stop at about four while they really consolidate, um, I would think within a few years, we'll see regular carrier deployment to the Indian Ocean and occasionally further afield. And of course, there are amphibious forces developing rapidly for much the same reasons. There is a Taiwan element, but in my view, what we're seeing is the Chinese starting to evolve amphibious ready group concepts. And indeed the um, type 071s, um, the big LPDs have been operating in the Indian Ocean on occasion. We have yet to see the new LPHs, which of course are really just in their trials and acceptance to service phase um, op uh, operate yet. But also I make the point, I'm sorry, uh, I make the point that in addition to the capabilities I've talked about, the Chinese are starting to develop a fleet train uh, they do have a range of very capable support ships. And of course, uh, they've now established the base at Djibouti. Now, all this argues is what's the response? Well, the response from countries like Australia um, needs to be twofold. One is Australia has to be conscious of the extent to which it can contribute to general deterrent effect. And for that reason, Australia needs pretty highly capable forces and indeed um, both in the Navy and indeed in the air, I think you know that's reflected. And of course, although it's taking far too long, one of that's one of the reasons why we're shifting from six to 12 submarines. But in addition, uh, we need to have units uh, across the spectrum which can match and uh, effectively assert our interests and maintain our presence um, as China expands its activities and asserts its interests. Uh, so that includes constabulary patrol boats in the South Pacific, as well as task groups operating in the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea, which have high capability. And similarly, uh, we need to operate with the Americans and, of course, with the other powers of the quad quadrilateral that's forming uh, to be able to generate and be seen to generate sufficient combat power 
um, that that does have deterrent effects. And India is in much the same situation, although I think Australia is resource constrained. I would say the Indian Navy is equally so, if not more so, uh, particularly as uh, India has many concerns on its own land borders. And I think some dynamics of priorities, uh, both India and Australia, arguably are um, maritime powers with continental preoccupations, many of which uh, India has a good excuse for. So India is attempting to uh, have a multitude of capabilities in order that it can um, not only assert its interests, but create its own deterrent effects. So finally, let me just touch on the prospective Indian uh, United Kingdom deployment to the South China Sea. I think politically that's going to be a valuable um, effort but I think it needs to be a uh, base, uh, it needs to be conducted uh, with some discretion, not so much in the sense that, um, you know, we're not saying that's a serious capability, but the reflection that it re does represent a very considerable investment, which it will be impossible to sustain. So I think it's its political signal and its contributory signal. Let me finally say, however, that I think the management of what happens in the South China Sea is going to be very important. The real danger to me isn't what one does within 12 miles of artificial islands or rocks and China's claims to particular features in the South China Sea and interpretations of the law of the sea. The real danger is I think China has a genuine desire to make the South China Sea a completely closed sea with no non-literal states allowed to have military and naval forces in that area. And frankly, the literal states other than China are pretty constrained in their behavior. Um, so I think it's very important that deployments like the United Kingdom deployment, like the French deployment that's happened, and indeed La Perouse is taking place as an exercise in the Bay of Bengal as we speak. Um, but these sort of operations, as Australia's been doing recently, as the Americans are doing, as the Japanese are doing, emphasise the fact that it is the high seas uh, in terms of naval forces, that it is an open sea, it is not a closed sea, and that we all have a right to operate there. So I'll finish at that. Well, thank you very 